Well, good morning and welcome to our virtual business forum presented by the Ulster County Regional Chamber of Commerce. My name is Ward Todd. Thank you for joining us today. We are delighted to have with us via Zoom, Assemblyman Kevin Cahill and New York State Senator Jen Metzger. Today, for those of you who are just waking up, is June the 9th, and it is a day that many of our small businesses have been waiting for. This is the second phase of the planned reopening of New York State's economy as it pertains to the Ulster County region and the Hudson Valley, so appropriate that we are having two of our elected state representatives to talk about the reopening today and what that means to our local businesses. Uh, there is guidance on a number of websites. We direct you to the Ulster Chamber website if you're in one of the businesses that are reopening today or in the planned phases ahead, so you can begin to have an idea of the kinds of uh, New York State recommendations that, uh, that are available for you. And I do want to urge you on behalf of our Chamber staff and our Board of Directors, please support our small businesses. That will not be the first time uh, nor the last time you're hearing that, I'm sure, uh, over the next several days and weeks. Buy local, shop local, keep it local. Think of our local small businesses right here in the Ulster County region. Before we start our program, we would like to thank our good friends here at the 721 Media Center, including Ellen Bogan Creative Media, for live streaming our event today. Ellen Bogan Media Center has been on the forefront of media industry, helping companies, government, and organizations communicate through audio and video for 30 years. So whether it's live streaming, video production, event AV, or digital marketing services, discover how Ellen Bogan can help your business during these difficult times and into the future. Visit ellenbogan.com or you can call them at 845-33-VIDEO. That's 845-33-VIDEO. A reminder, our next virtual breakfast meeting takes place a week from today. It will be a celebration of the 100th anniversary of women's right to vote and the impact Ulster County and Mid-Hudson Valley women had on the suffrage movement and the eventual passage of this landmark legislation. Presenters will include former presiding justice of the New York Supreme Court Appellate Division, the Honorable Karen Peters, Ulster County Clerk Nina Postupak, Ulster County Elections Commissioner Ashley Dittis, and from the League of Women Voters of the Mid-Hudson, Cindy Bell and Jennifer Clark. The morning's hosts will include Crystal Jacob, the chair-elect of the Chamber Board of Directors, and Jess Davis, the Chamber's Director of Membership Engagement. Proudly, as we pay tribute to all women and all women leaders everywhere, our board chair, Dave Gagnon, and myself will be far in the background for this event next week. Join us live stream or on Facebook Live. And I'd like to take a minute to thank our virtual business forum sponsors today, including our friends at the Kingston Plaza with more than 40 stores, which represent a healthy mix of national retail chains, professional offices, and local businesses. The Plaza is locally owned and managed by Herzog Supply Company. On-site property management guarantees immediate attention to tenants' needs. The Plaza maintains an immaculate presence from sidewalks to landscaping, parking areas, snow removal, signage, and seasonal decorations. Competitive leasing opportunities are currently available. Visit their website, kingstonplaza.com. We also want to thank Ulster Savings Bank, a longtime Ulster Chamber corporate leader. Our community has been through some unprecedented times in the past few months. As many businesses were forced to close and lay off their employees, financial relief became crucial. No loan was too small or unimportant for Ulster Savings to process. Their team helped to quickly process 455 PPP loans, providing more than $34 million in financial assistance and helping to save 4,731 local jobs. If Main Street has a chance anywhere, it's with Ulster Savings. In fact, 91.43% of their PPP loans were for businesses with fewer than 25 employees. And only 5.49% of loans were for amounts over $250,000. The smallest loan amount was for just $300, a testament to community-minded bankers devoted to doing all they can to help local business, regardless of size, survive and thrive. Providing financial flexibility in a time of need is paramount. Ulster Savings responded by waiving ATM, overdraft, and a long list of other fees. Higher ATM cash limits, faster direct deposits, and suspension of excessive transactions on savings and money market accounts helps to navigate through these tough times. 
With job loss comes payment worries. Ulster Savings offered loan payment deferral options for up to six months, with those deferred payments due at the end of the loan with no penalty, an example of true payment relief. Knowing nonprofits could not fundraise or supply for uh, grants easily, Ulster Savings immediately stepped up with proactive giving. Over $324,000 has been dispersed to agencies providing critical services to date, and they're not finished. Providing socially distanced, safety-first transactions means being innovative. Ulster Savings has the area's first drive-up closing process to enable loan closings to continue through the pandemic, enabling customers to save on monthly payments by refinancing existing loans. When Ulster Savings talks about being there for you, they truly are. Thank you, Ulster Savings. And thanks to our good friends at Norman Staffing this morning. It's difficult to capture in words how devastating the last few months have been to our community. At Norman Staffing, they've seen firsthand the impact this pandemic has had on local businesses. You've faced overwhelming challenges and have been forced to reinvent the way you do business in order to survive. And it's been hard. But in all their years of serving Ulster County, never before have the folks at Norman Staffing felt as proud of our business community as they do today. As we rebuild our economy, Norman Staffing wants you to know they are here for you. Whether you're seeking a job or to hire somebody, they're here to support your business as you learn to navigate this new normal. Whether your needs are for remote staff or on-site employees, temporary or permanent staff, full or part-time, Norman Staffing has the workforce ready to help you rebuild. Norman Staffing is here for you at normanstaffing.com or call them at 845-338-9111. Thank you, Tony Marmo, and thanks to all of our great sponsors this morning. So at this time, we're delighted to welcome State Senator Jen Metzger and Assemblyman Kevin Cahill to our Chamber of Commerce Virtual Business Forum. We want to remind everybody that we are live on Facebook, and they have graciously agreed to take some questions from you following their remarks this morning. You can ask your questions on the Facebook page. And let's begin this morning with Senator Metzger. We welcome you. Good morning, Senator. How are you today? I had to unmute. Can you hear me now? We got it. Thank you, uh, Senator. It's great to be back uh, talking with you all, virtually that is. I want to thank you, Ward, for bringing us together. And I'm thrilled to be here with my distinguished partner in the Assembly, Kevin Cahill. Uh, we work very closely together to make sure our community's needs are addressed, both at the state level and in our work in the district. And uh, I've been really thankful to have such a tremendous partner and longtime leader to, to work with. Uh, my district is a bit, a bit bigger than his, uh, as Senate districts are. Uh, the 42nd district, uh, which I represent, covers six towns in Ulster, including New Paltz, Gardner, Shangum, Denning, Wawarzing, and my hometown of Rosendale. Uh, it also covers the whole western half of Orange County, all of Sullivan, Sullivan County and part of Delaware, Delaware County. Uh, it's geographically the largest uh, district in the majority conference spanning 2,400 square miles. Uh, and it's also the most rural with over 2,000 farms. And I have the great privilege of chairing the Senate Agriculture Committee. Uh, agriculture is such an important driver of our economy, of course, very important to our tourism industry as well. Um, this has been an extraordinarily difficult and challenging time for everyone uh, during this unprecedented pandemic. Um, these last few months have, have certainly felt like an eternity. Uh, it's been a real, a real struggle for many of you and your employees and families. Um, much of my work during this time has been focused on the district, on helping people uh, get through this. Uh, my office has been directly helping over 1,600 people in getting through the Department of Labor's overwhelmed um, an insurance, uh, unemployment insurance system. Uh, we've been, um, you know, helping people. Uh, helping businesses and farmers get the information and resources they need and, uh, and you know, helping expedite uh, PPP, PPE where that was needed. Um, it's, it's just been really about 
that whatever direct help we can provide. Um, thankfully, New York's social distancing and other steps have uh, taken to fight this virus are working. And the Mid-Hudson region, as you mentioned, Ward, today begins phase two of the four-phase reopening process. Uh, phase two includes offices, hair salons and barber shops, uh, real estate, uh, vehicle sales, leases and rentals, and, and some other businesses. Um, I will say that all three of my sons are looking a lot like cousin it these days from the Adams family. So we've been counting the days to get them to Bill's barber shop and uh, counting the days to phase two. Um, I also wanted to mention that outdoor dining at, at restaurants can also begin now. This is something that I was actually really advocating for with the governor's office and was pleased to see uh, that it was that outdoor dining was bumped up to phase two from phase three. Um, indoor dining and food service is otherwise slated to reopen in the next phase, phase three. And then the final phase, phase four, will include uh, the arts, entertainment, recreation, and education. Um, the reopening plan, uh, I want to note, you know, was developed by the executive branch, uh, not the legislature. Uh, Empire State Development and the Department of Health are the primary state agencies that have been involved in this process. Um, each region proceeds from one phase to the next after at least 14 days uh, based on an assessment of risk. Uh, there are seven health metrics that each region ha had to meet to begin the reopening process and these metrics are being continuously tracked uh, to make sure that you know we're 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 still on track and can proceed from one phase to the next, um, I do want to mention that uh, industry specific guidance has been uh, is has been developed for businesses um, uh, for each phase by Empire State Development, and that guidance can be found at forward.ny.gov. Um, it's important to note that all businesses are required to develop a written uh, New York Forward Safety Plan outlining how your workplace will uh, prevent the spread of the virus. Uh, my Chief of Staff, Leah Goldman, will post the safety plan template in the comments section of this Zoom meeting so you can access it. Uh, the safety plan does not have to be submitted to a state agency for approval. Uh, but businesses are responsible for ensuring that the plan is readily available on the premises uh, in the event of an inspection by the State Department of Health or other local health authorities. Um, I also want to mention a recent executive order uh, that authorizes businesses to deny individuals entry uh, if they're not wearing a, a face covering of some kind. Um, I, I, try to emphasize everywhere I go that it is so, so important that we continue to follow uh, health protocols like wearing face uh, coverings, uh, like uh, practicing social distancing uh, so that we can continue to remain on track uh, to re fully reopen our economy. We really don't want to uh, undo the, the, the progress we've made. Um, my office has received a lot of uh, industry-specific questions about reopening from businesses and employees, and we'll con continue to, to do the best we can to provide answers. Uh, I encourage you all to please consider my office uh, a resource if you haven't been in touch with us. Um, and if you know there are questions that you have for me today, if I, if I can't answer them today, um, we, I can certainly get back to you and just want to let you know that you can contact my office anytime at 845-344-3311 or email me at metzger at nysenate.gov. Um, now, in addition to directly helping our constituents in the district during this challenging time, uh, we've continued our work as legislators on legislation. Uh, and recently, uh, the legislature took action on over 30 bills to address statewide needs during this pandemic. Uh, these included bills to provide much needed relief to New Yorkers facing COVID-related uh, financial hardship, 
uh, including rent relief, um, mortgage relief, and relief from utility shutoffs. Um, we passed a bill I sponsored to, uh, with Assemblywoman Linda Rosenthal to expand the definition of telemedicine to include audio-only services. Um, telemedicine, as, as many of you I'm sure know, have, has played a particularly important role during this pandemic. It's allowed people to access uh, medical professionals for both physical and mental health needs. Uh, from the safety of their own homes. Um, but uh, a big problem, especially for uh, the more rural parts of my district, is uh, there's no broadband service. Um, and this, um, and, and there are still people that don't have computers too, um, especially many older uh, elderly uh, New Yorkers. So, so this bill was important. Um, it, to allow affordable access to telemedicine services if you are if you only have a phone available. So I was very pleased that we passed that, uh, that legislation. I also wanna mention legislation that um, will be of particular interest uh, to you all that would enable IDAs to provide no interest loans of up to $25,000 to local businesses and nonprofit organizations for supplies and materials to protect health and safety, such as PPE and protective plexiglass windows. Um, uh, so this, this um, could potentially be a resource if Ulster County IDA is interested in setting up such a program. Um, I also wanna to just touch, uh, touch on some legislation that may be of interest to, to you all that we passed pre-pandemic which now seems so long ago. Um, earlier this year, the state Senate unanimously passed uh, legislation I introduced to require the Secretary of State to publish a small business compliance guide, uh, giving businesses timely access to information in uh, readable plain English uh, about changes that will help them avoid unnecessary penalties. Uh, the guide would be published annually on the Empire State Development Small Business Division's website and cover regulatory changes um, of the previous year. Uh, keeping up with regulatory changes can be a real burdensome task for any business owner. And uh, I developed this legislation after speaking with local chambers and business owners who, um, you know, it was very clear that there was a need for this resource. Uh, I also want to mention a bill that I co-sponsored to enable small businesses to create a tax deferred savings account for a rainy day fund for periods of economic hardship or natural disaster. Um, obviously in a time like this, this kind of uh, tool would be extremely valuable. I passed the Senate last year and I'm hoping that we can get it passed uh, through the full legislature this year. Uh, we also passed legislation to help businesses meet regulatory requirements, and this was signed into law, um, by uh, providing a cure period for a first violation instead of immediately imposing a fine and, and providing businesses with information, including uh, um, an in-person consultation, potentially um, to help them better understand compliance issues. Um, in my role as agriculture chair, I have been focused on expanding market op opportunities for our farmers in New York. I partnered with my counterpart in the assembly, Donna Lopardo, who chairs the agriculture committee in that house, uh, in developing the state framework for the production and sale of hemp and CBD products. Uh, that was signed into law at the end of last year. Uh, it was needed to provide uh, the regulatory certainty for this new industry to grow uh, and for farmers to diversify into this high value crop. It almost never happens that uh, a new high value crop comes along. So we wanted to make sure that we could really, our farmers and especially our small farmers of which we have many in New York could take advantage of it uh, and also provide protections to consumers uh, um, uh, just in terms of like safety and quality. So it was a very important major piece of legislation. Um, we also, um, I've been very focused on uh, 
um, strengthening our regional food systems. We really need to be expanding our investments in aggr aggregation, marketing, and distribution networks. I think that this pandemic uh, and its impacts on supply chains have really shown us the importance of having a strong and resilient regional food system. Um, I actually just introduced uh, last week legislation that would double the state's investment in the new Nourish New York program, which uh, is a new initiative which purchases products from New York farms and producers for distribution to regional food pantries to address the growing food insecurity that we have been seeing during this di uh, difficult time. I'm looking beyond this pandemic uh, there is a lot we can do to strengthen New York markets for New York produced goods, including, uh, you know, expanding farm to school as well as farm to other institutions, uh, farm to hospitals, farm to nursing homes, um, and uh, really building those building those markets. So we're we're I'm go I actually am probably coming close to time, and I know that Kevin has a lot to share as well. Um, but uh, I'm really happy to be here and to uh, answer any questions. And thanks, thanks for inviting me, Ward. Thank you very much, Senator. Appreciate your input and your perspective from uh, the New York State Senate. On the assembly side, we're delighted to have with us uh, senior assemblyman, I guess, Kevin Cahill at this point. Good morning, Kevin. Thank you for being with us. Looks like you're in Albany today. Yeah, it looks that way, but it's not so. I'm in my dining room. Uh, that's one of those Zoom virtual backgrounds. I don't know quite how to do what Jen did with putting up a document, but I sure could fake where I am. Um, <laughs> I, I am also, uh, I just concluded another meeting on a different Zoom with the Ways and Means Committee because we are actually in session uh, today. Uh, before session begins, we have our committee meetings and that's what just concluded. So let me start by saying thank you more to you and to Dave and to Jess for for having us and to Ulster Savings and Bill for sponsoring and Norman Staffing and Tony and Kingston Plaza and Brad and of course, Ellen Bogan Media and Jeremy. We're so grateful for all that 721 does in our community. Uh, I'd also like to thank the members of the chamber for joining us. Uh, speeches are no good without audiences, so they're the most important people here. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to say a few words about the folks who are with us here today. Anthony and Arcal provide valuable services in our community and during uh, regular times, what they do is difficult and complex and during these very extraordinary times, um, Anthony, I'm sure will give us some ideas about how to make sure that as we go into phase two, phase three, phase four, and then back into the rest of real life, uh, that we don't forget people with, uh, with disabilities and make sure that they're fully included. So thank you, Anthony and Arcal. Um, if you're as old as me, you remember young Joan Gunderson walking around trying to convince the rest of us that this was an important issue. Seems like only yesterday, but in fact, it was uh, 37 years ago. So thanks, Arcal, for all that you do. Um, and, and also, before I get to substantive remarks, let me also um, tip my hat to uh, my partner, Jen Metzger, who's just been terrific. Um, I've always had a great relationship with the other local representatives that I've worked with going back, you know, the late Billy Larkin and John Bonasek Susarino and Steve Saland across the river. Um, it has been an important partnership to have, but let me tell you, uh, it's almost impossible to keep up with this uh, bundle of energy, Jen Metzger. She's, she's unbelievable. Um, just trying to keep up with her is, is a challenge unto itself. We talk a lot, several times a week, uh, we exchange intelligence about what's going on in our houses. We um, uh, talk to each other about legislation that affects our districts, but also about statewide issues. We, I'm very happy to get Jen's perspective. She comes from a community activist background where I knew her well then. Uh, and she often uh, pretends to care about my uh, old man point of view on things. So I'm very grateful for that. Okay. Uh, probably the most important thing that we're doing right now is identifying every gap in the cell phone network that exists in the Mid-Hudson Valley and Catskill region. Invariably, I call Jen as she's going into the deep recesses of Sullivan County, and she waits to call me till I'm in Eastern Dutchess County at the far ends of Rhinebeck and Red Hook. So we're sure that, uh, that we know where every bad part of cell services around here. So. Um, 
even when we lose our call, we make sure to call each other back. Uh, working with Jen has been, without question, uh, part of the all-time high of my public career, and I'm very grateful to have her as the partner. Her enthusiasm is exceeded only by her energy, her integrity, and her drive, uh, and her creativity. Um, so thank you, voters, for giving us Jen, and we all are looking forward to having her back uh, next year. So now that I used up all my time saying thank you, uh, 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 you know, I'll just say that 2020 is a year like we've never seen before. Uh, we've been in Albany physically fewer days than any year that I know of, uh, but we've also been called upon to, to deal with some of the greatest challenges that, that I think I've faced uh, ever since being in public office. Uh, technology, luckily, has allowed us to continue to work uninterrupted both at the constituent level and in Albany, and we have done so. Uh, we've conducted several sessions using Zoom. We've conducted remote sessions even when we were in Albany doing the budget. Uh, as I just mentioned, we just completed a committee meeting here. Uh, there will be several more of those today, and, and we will take votes on several measures of importance today um, via Zoom. And uh, I will say that it's not as good as being in Albany, not just for me, but also for activist groups that want to be heard. Um, but at least we're not freezing democracy, and that's important. Um, I will say that we conducted a hearing just a few weeks ago in May uh, with small businesses from across the state. Many of the statewide organizations that represent youth uh, were present at that hearing, and we heard a lot from them about what they think uh, their needs are, not only during the pandemic, but how to survive after the pandemic. Uh, we conveyed much of that information to our federal representatives since a lot of it involved federal issues, but then we also turned some of it into a COVID agenda that we dealt with here in Albany, well, there in Albany, and, uh, and we will certainly continue to, to be listening to uh, those people who we count on to be um, the strength of our communities to, to move forward. Um, let me tell you about some of the challenges that we face. You know them, but it, it, it warrants repeating. Uh, there was a gaping hole in the budget at the beginning of this year, and almost as soon as we got a handle on that, when we filled that hole, uh, the pandemic hit us. And, and we, New York State, became the epicenter of that pandemic for several weeks. And uh, uh, we were just about coming out of that, and we faced a paradigm shift in how the public perceives law enforcement and community. So we were called back into the session for that. Um, tax revenues are indescribably low uh, needs, particularly with the extraordinary expenses of the pandemic and the restaging of our healthcare system and our schools and the deep quarantine are at an all time high. We've never seen uh, the needs this high. Uh, we wait patiently and optimistically for the federal government to step in um, the way that they help the middle states when the Mississippi uh, overruns its banks, the way that they help the Southwest when wildfires and earthquakes hit, the way that they help Florida when tropical storms uh, wipe them, wipe that area out in the whole Gulf Coast. Um, we need the federal government to fill in uh, where we cannot fill in for ourselves. Uh, having said that, let's acknowledge that there will be cuts. There, there must be cuts to our budget. We cannot sustain the level of revenue loss that we've had uh, without creating some cuts. Um, there will also be revenues. We will have to raise taxes. There's no two ways about that. We have to do so in order to provide the basis of services that we're responsible for. But slashing healthcare by a quarter and slashing education by 20% simply isn't acceptable. And neither are new taxes that would burden the already overburdened working people of the state of New York. So. We are working day and night to try to come up with creative solutions um, to, to all of these problems. But let me repeat, because it's really the, the, the most important thing, is that we are waiting for the federal government. We need the federal government to step in. Uh, without federal help, uh, we probably uh, will see dire consequences here. Um, and we're being patient, but time is, is, is starting to run out. Uh, Gutting the budget and raising taxes are not the answer, but you know we're going to see it. We should recognize that in good times, we send to the federal government about a dollar twenty-five for every one dollar they give back to us. That number has actually risen in the past couple of years, 
with the end of the state and local tax deduction or the, the cap on it. So we're sending more to the federal government than we get back. Um, if they want us to return to be that robust and healthy and involuntary benefactor for the rest of the country, they're going to have to help us get going again. Broadway is dark. Main Street from Buffalo to Mont Montauk is mostly shut down. Um, record numbers, about one in nine people, about 15% of our workforce is collecting unemployment. We want to get back to work. In fact, we want to roar back to work. And that will only happen if the feds lend us a hand. I, I will point out that this has happened before. Uh, we called upon a couple of New Yorkers to help us. There was a young a man who was the governor of the state of New York from Hyde Park named Roosevelt who created the New Deal for New York. And uh, he brought it to Washington and rescued the whole country. When he went there, he brought a young man named Arthur Fleming with him who was an academic from Kingston, New York. And Arthur Fleming crafted many of the programs that helped lift us from, from the Great Depression uh, and then set us on the course of the modern industrial economy that we had. We need a Democrat from New York like, or like Franklin Roosevelt, Chuck Schumer is a Democrat from New York, and a Republican from New York like Arthur Fleming was. Uh, Donald Trump is a Republican from New York. We need them to cast politics aside and and make sure we get what we need here in New York. Uh, Jen discussed some of the issues. I discussed the COVID issue. Uh, but this week, we reconvened to take up a package of bills that will hopefully begin to heal uh, the festering, uh, long-standing wound that is growing between law enforcement and the communities they represent, particularly communities of color. Uh, we will take that agenda up. I was so pleasantly surprised yesterday when we took up 14 seemingly controversial bills and saw very broad, uh, un almost unanimous bipartisan support for that legislation. It proves that this is not a partisan issue, it's a societal issue that we have to deal with. Uh, Albany is one thing, Jen mentioned the, the work we're doing in our district office. We closed our beautiful offices that we used to share at 1 Albany Avenue. Uh, because it's a senior citizen housing complex, we actually closed it before uh, the rest of the state closed down. Uh, we will probably be out of that office longer than everybody else when you return to yours. But our office is fully functioning as a virtual office. My staff, some of whom are listening in here right now for a few minutes, spend every day dealing with unemployment. I don't have the size district Jen has, but we've handled over 500 unemployment cases. We've dealt with dozens of businesses looking for help to understand the state of federal bureaucracies during this time. Uh, we've published frequently asked questions on six or seven different topics, and uh, we continue to hear from literally hundreds of constituents as they uh, register their views on, on the issues of the day. Um, I'll just try to wrap up here. I see Ward giving me that very patient looking nod that says we're done. Uh, <laughs> But I will say that uh, you know, we've had economic crises, we've had a crazy cold spring, we've had budget woes, we've had a pandemic, we now have civil unrest, and guess what? It's not e we're not even halfway through the year yet. Um, I haven't heard of a horde of locusts yet, but don't forget this is the cycle of the year when the cicadas come back, so that'll make us feel like, it, like we're having locusts. So things are pretty tough this year, but I remain optimistic uh, because we're not just stores and businesses and governments and institutions and traditions, uh, we're people. And I have faith in the Daves and the Wards and the Jessens and the Bills and the Tonys and, uh, and, the, and the Jeremys and the Cheryls and, and the Wands and the Ellens and the Jones and the Rebeccas and the Michelles and the Jens of the world to make sure uh, that we can get back here. I, I open by thanking all of you, and I'll close by thanking our teachers, our healthcare workers, our grocery store clerks, our first responders, our delivery folks, the essential public employees, and everyone, including many of your members, who dub, double down to deal with this unprecedented uh, uh, circumstance. And I look forward to seeing you all in our restaurants again, at community events, at local fundraisers, and everything else that makes us smile. Uh, because we live in this wonderful, beautiful place where we do. 
All right, thanks, uh, Kevin and Jen. Both, uh, I'll ask both of you a question that a couple of people have raised already, and that is that we acknowledge that there will be pain from Albany. Any idea what we're looking at in terms of uh, specific tax increases, possibly sales tax, property tax? What's going to, what do you think is going to be the impact of uh, this pandemic on the local individual property tax owner? I, Ward, I'll, I'll start with that and then defer, of course, to Jen. Uh, we are working as hard as we can to minimize any of that impact. Uh, you know, much of what we spend in the state budget is passed down to the local governments and the school districts. And what we don't provide has to be made up locally. There is an acknowledgement that, that a lot of people just can't do it. School districts are already bracing themselves for not just the new way of voting this week, um, but, but also for concern of voters who feel like they can't afford their budget. So we are working as hard as we can. Um, the budget office has been authorized to cut uh, up to, uh, up to uh, uh, 20% in the first phase uh, of both healthcare and, and uh, uh, education funding. We don't think that's at all acceptable. And I should point out a bill that, that Jen raised and I'll let her talk about it. Uh, that would put a check on the budget office to make sure that that doesn't happen. But as I said, we honestly do believe that the federal government will step in and, and will give us the help we need to get over this hump. And hopefully we will see a minimal impact on local property taxpayers. Senator Metzger. Thank you. So, um, you know, I, I just echo uh, the comments of Kevin. I, really people, in my district cannot afford uh, an increase in property taxes. I mean, it's the, well before this pandemic, people were already struggling to hold on to their homes. Um, I, uh, you know, as, as Kevin said, we really, we have to have uh, a, a, an infusion of funding from the federal government. Um, we do have to look at, at ways to raise revenue. Um, from my perspective, uh, if it's going to be from taxpayers, it's got to be just from the very, very top of the income, uh, income earners in our state. Uh, and um, because really, the, the ordinary people cannot afford it. Um, I did, uh, Kevin alluded to a bill that uh, I introduced that we're, we're carrying together uh, that would, it's actually based on a recommendation of our state comptroller uh, to require that the, the, the budget director um, publish a monthly report um, that we all have access to and can comment on um, on the the revenues and expenditures of the state during this difficult time and and to report on any proposed cuts because we every New York the legislature and New Yorkers need to be able to see what's coming and have an opportunity to weigh in at a time um, you know we adopted when we adopted this budget um, it was a time of incredible, fiscal uncertainty. Uh, we knew that there was going to be a severe reduction in revenues. We did not know the extent and could not know the extent of that reduction and, and gave the governor the authority at certain periods of the year to, to propose adjustments to the budget uh, if there is a decline. Um, but, but that authority comes with responsibility, and we need to know, as um, as New Yorkers, what's coming down the pike. We have it's important for us to, uh, from from both and business businesses and every school districts and everyone else, to have have the information both for their own planning, but also to have the opportunity to give input on it. So, um, we would love to see that legislation move forward. Uh, Bill Calderera writes in, I understand the requirements for businesses reopening in the phase plan, but he has a question about essential businesses that never close. It's unclear if these businesses need to do anything for the state. Can one of you answer that? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the tail end of that yeah. question. 
Um, so that's it's, un a very it's unclear if those businesses that never closed, if they have right. to do anything for the state. Right. That's a very good question. Uh, I mean, all businesses have to follow um, the health and safety protocols. That's very important. Um, right. But in terms of uh, industry, like the kind of industry specific guidance that's coming out for industries that reopen, I am I'm not aware if that is being put together for those that are all already, you know, have been operating, as you say, throughout this pandemic. Um, uh, Kevin, do you have, uh, are you aware of any, anything? And I can double check that, but I'm not aware of any guidance. I, I, I would agree with you, Jen. And by the way, thank you, Bill, for uh, those loans, especially the $300 one. I want to know more about that. that that's one very interesting to me. I did talk to a local merchant who got a, a thousand dollar loan and he said it was enough to keep him going and that's all he wanted to do. And, and, and uh, it seems amazing to me that, that some of these businesses are able to get by on a, on a threadbare, uh, but, but they are. And by the way, Janet was a Rosendale business who told me that. Um, uh, the the uh, question about the uh, essential businesses that are open now, uh, the only thing I would suggest to you is that there may be new opportunities. I know a few folks, particularly in the warehouse and distribution industry, who were able to open on a very limited basis in the first phase, they may be able to uh, uh, expand that, that, that operation to some extent. But as Jen said, everyone will be required to meet the, uh, the distancing standards and uh, the safety guidelines. Uh, but so far as I know, they won't have to submit any additional uh, information to the state on, on their compliance. A question from Donna Moss about legislation that's in Albany, I believe, about establishing virtual notary public laws. Is that in uh, either house? I'm not familiar with it, but it made some sense. Uh, it made some sense for a long time. Uh, we allow a lot of things to happen on the internet. My credit card information is floating out there with a bunch of different people. Um, I've been voting in the state legislature virtually for for over a month now, uh, it seems fair to me that if a notary could uh, could determine the, uh, uh, the the authenticity of a signature and the circumstances under which it was rendered, uh, they ought to be allowed to do so. I'm involved in a real estate transaction right now, and by contract, we have agreed uh, that everything that we are doing virtually is the same as if we did it in person. Uh, that's not necessarily so when a notarized signature is required. There are protocols that can already be followed. You do it when you file your federal income taxes online. Uh, that can assure that it's your identity and that you mean what you said. And I think it's time to take a look at that. And uh, it sure would be great on a Sunday afternoon when you have to get that notarized document uh, uh, that, that if you could just call the friend who can do it virtually, that they could just pick you up on a Zoom and do it or whatever is the process. So I'll look at that and it's something I would support, not just for the pandemic, but for on a permanent basis. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and you know, I believe it has been enabled not for every single use, but for some uses during the pandemic. And there, there are a number of changes that were made during this pandemic, specifically for the circumstance um, that you know, we might want to look at going forward. And I, and I, I do think that that is one of them. My, my Cracker Jack staff tells me that that bill was introduced in the Senate by the other Ulster County Senator, uh, James Scoofus, uh, one of the other Ulster County Senators uh, last year. And it was like, what are you crazy? And this year it's like, wow, what a great idea. So we'll <laughs> probably be taking it up. All right. Senator Metzger, Assemblyman Kale, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, we appreciate it. We hope to have you back here real soon. Thanks again. Thank Absolutely. You. Thanks for having us. Thank you. <laughs> Our next guest this morning is here to discuss some of the issues facing businesses as they reopen today. He is the executive director of RCAL, the Resource Center for Accessible Living. Please welcome Anthony Mignon. Good morning, Anthony, and we thank you for being with us. And if you would, from your perspective, give us some of the uh, things that businesses need to look for as they start the reopening process today. Good morning, Ward. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm here today because I know that we're about ready to reopen our businesses here in Ulster County and I around the region. And I wanted to make sure that we here at Arcal wanted to make sure that everyone was thinking about individuals with disabilities returning as 
customers to your store as well. There's so many things going on and there's so many things thinking about to think about that I wanted to make sure that you didn't put yourself in a position where you were an ADA compliant or that you were going to have a customer who was very unhappy as they came to get services and they were unable to. Very, very simple stuff. You know, you've been doing this for years. I'm sure you were compliant four months ago. Uh, um, you have multiple entrances. You're trying to control traffic. You want to make sure that people are only coming and going from one location. Please pick the, the door, the entrance that you're going to leave open as the accessible one. If the accessible door is closed and locked because you're trying to control traffic, that's not going to help somebody who needs to get in who is in a mobility device. If you're keeping flow of traffic up and down only certain aisles, if you have a, a queue line outside, please make sure that that is at least 36 inches wide so that people, again, with mobility devices could come in. I know here at RCAL, we're talking about our lobby is a little small and people are gonna have to wait outside sometimes. If you're gonna have people waiting outside, some individuals with some types of physical disabilities just can't stand the heat. They can't stand that long in line, period. So please make sure you have um, sanitized chairs ready and waiting for them in socially distant spaces in the parking lots. Things, things along those lines are courteous, amongst other things, and they will help you to be able to bring valued service to more individuals. Something that is very important that a lot of people are not thinking of is that if an individual who is hard of hearing or deaf and that reads lips comes into your facility for assistance and everybody who is going to greet them in a common area is going to have a face mask on, that is just not going to be very helpful. Um, what we've done here is we have brought in some class uh, face shields, plastic, plastic face shields for our faces so that we can remove our mask and put the face shield on to assist people. We've brought in extra ones to be able to hand them to individuals so that they can do the same and maybe even have a small whiteboard around with a couple of dry erase markers. Um, make sure, of course, you have your uh, wipes, disinfectant wipes, so you can clear everything in between. But little things like this uh, are going to help you to be the responsible corporate citizen, even in times of pandemic, apocalypse, whatever you want to say that we're in at the moment. Um, but it would be valuable for us to remember to keep thinking about all of our individuals, not just rushing to get the door open and figure it out later. Um, another thing that everybody should have been doing all along, but it's hard to think about, um, we're pushing more and more of our commerce digitally. We're looking more and more to our websites and on sites online sales. With that in mind, please take a moment to make sure that your website is ADA compliant that there's readers for people who have visual impairments, that um, you're not all in tables. I designed websites 20 years ago and nothing that I know works now. So um, you have to think about modernizing your website and bringing it up to a way that everybody could be able to use it. Um, there are hundreds of things on this piece of paper and Resource Center for Accessible Living here, 331-0541. Um, we are available to give us a call. Um, we can help you. You, we can, you can bounce questions off of us. You can go online to rcal.org and get our contact information if you missed it, as I just said it. Um, and we are here to, to help and assist everybody who needs it to even just think it out, talk it out. Gilles Malkin is our architectural modification specialist, and he is available. Most people know him. I just saw Warden Todd light up just at the mention of his name. He's a very kind man. Um, and we are all here to, to assist you in any way possible. Thank you, Warden. Thanks, Anthony. Uh, Gilles, we'll go to your place of uh, your office and make sure that it's compliant and give you some suggestions, right, for how you can uh, make it more compliant if need be, and uh, he's got some great resources. Uh, so thank you again, uh, Anthony at RCAL, Resource Center for Accessible Living. Good friends, uh, keep up the wonderful work that you're doing.
Listen, it's a gorgeous day in the Hudson Valley, and uh, there's no better, better place, I think, than to spend this afternoon or tonight that's outdoors because we are opening today, not virtually, but really for real, restaurants dining outdoors. And Jess Davis is with us today down in the Kingston waterfront where she has had a chance to already check out some of the places that are ready to open today. And Jess, we turn it to you. What's cooking? Hey, good morning. You're right. Best backdrop of all of the guest speakers today. I just joining us uh, here on the waterfront, and the weather would not be better for our um, if we had ordered it ourselves. So I'm just going to take you through a little virtual tour of downtown and uh, visit a few of the restaurants that are excited and ready to begin opening today and welcome all of us back into their space. So let's just bear with me while I turn it around. So I'm here in TR Gallo Park. And as you can see, there's some families feeding the ducks. It's a beautiful space down here on the water. Uh, I spoke with Sal Guido from Mariners Harbor last night and they are still working hard to get everything ready to uh, enable a very safe and planned environment. So they'll be speaking today, uh, finishing preparing the outdoor patio. There's no this summer, uh, like a beverage, an appetizer, or a meal out here at Mariners Harbor overlooking the beautiful river. So I will be back here tomorrow evening at 7.30 p.m. And if you haven't joined our Facebook group, Ulster Eateries United, please do so because I will be joining my colleague and someone who's worked very hard alongside our chamber staff to support the eateries through this time, Allison Costan. So please check us out. We'll be going live tomorrow. As we come on down, we're gonna take a look I believe Next Boutique opens today for appointment only shopping. What a privilege. Um, so here we are, shipped over. They've got some plans in place and they're just waiting for approvals to expand on this outdoor barbecue that they've been working on through the coronavirus crisis. So stay tuned for that. Some sidewalk street dining is in their plan. I'm gonna take it over here. So when I first talked to Ward about working with the chamber, he said, I want some feet in the streets. So I think if anything says feet in the streets, it would be this. Beautiful. This morning as I was coming down, I saw Steven Savona and some of his team preparing as they will be opening today. Um, so let's see what they've got going on. They have three trattorias and they're working hard. Wow, it looks beautiful. So just take a look. Founding member of Ulster Eateries United. The Savona family is a wonderful member of our chamber. So you can see the social distancing in place. Seems like our restaurants have really got a good plan here and they're ready for us. Beautiful. So I'm gonna take it back down. I'll be joining the Savona family sometime over the next few days, hopefully to do a little dining and join you live while they're open. I'm gonna take you right across the street here. I'm just gonna turn this camera. Here I am walking and texting, walking and Facebooking. All right, so we're here at the Kingston Trolley Stop, Ulster County Tourism. And so just take a look 
up the Strand, we've got our friend Graziano at Downtown Cafe, Stella Bella Hair Salon is reopening today. So lots of great things, beautiful time of year to be down here. Again today, I will be on the Ulster Eateries United group uh, at noon. I will be joining Dave Amato and some friends for socially distanced outdoor dining here at Old Savannah. You can see families are out on the boats. So I'll be joining Old Savannah at noon, just past the Hudson River Maritime Museum. And there we go. I think, uh, I think that's a nice little show there. So again, thank you. Um, thank you, Ward. Thank you to all of our sponsors, to everyone that's watching with us today um, on behalf of the chamber staff and everyone uh, that's worked so hard around supporting our eateries. This is a really exciting day for, uh, for us in Ulster County. Um, and what I'd just like to say is we can really help our restaurants over the coming days. They're, they're gonna be facing the next set of challenges as they welcome us, welcome us back into their space. So um, we should take a look at the guidelines and make sure that we're prepared to follow those, to keep that six foot social distancing, to remain seated, um, to not mingle, even though it's gonna be nice to see neighbors again, um, but to remain seated, masks on until we're in our seat. And there, there's a whole bunch of guidelines that we can familiarize ourselves with so that when we walk into the restaurants, we already know what we need to do to help these restaurant owners and their wonderful staff uh, make this a huge success. So back to you, Ward. Thank you very much. All right, thanks, Jess. Enjoy the beautiful day on the Roundout waterfront. It is absolutely gorgeous. Uh, and as you travel throughout the city and throughout the county and the region, you'll see the owners out there, not just in restaurants, but in our retail establishments and others. They're cleaning the front door, uh, making sure that they're presentable. Some are doing a soft opening today. But with the phase two now here and open, we are delighted to be able to welcome many of our businesses for the first time in almost three months back open today. You'll find the guidelines that Jess was mentioning on the Chamber website, ulsterchamber.org. We have a whole a series of links for you. Be sure you understand as a business owner what your uh, clear guidance is. And as a consumer, you'll find information there as well. And we are on social media, as Jess mentioned. Uh, she's been the admin of Ulster Eateries United since we launched at the middle of March. Just delightful daily specials every single day. Consumers get to post the pictures of the food they bring home, so it's, it's a great site. We also have Ulster Small Businesses United, and we urge you to just check all the, that out, as well as our website, uh, help us on this road to recovery. Thank you for uh, joining us today. We sincerely appreciate you, our viewing audience, our chamber members. We look forward to seeing you again uh, not just virtually, but live and in person very soon. Our sponsors today, thanks to Norman Staffing, Ulster Savings Bank, and the Kingston Plaza. Also thanks to Jeremy Ellenbogen at Ellenbogen Creative Media here at the 721 Media Center. And a reminder for next week, our June 16th virtual breakfast meeting. We'll celebrate together the historic enactment of the 19th Amendment granting women the right to vote 100 years ago. Thanks so much to our presenters. The Honorable Karen Peters, Nina Postupak, Ashley Dittis, Cindy, Be Cindy Bell, and Jennifer Clark. And you can join us uh, live stream on our Chamber's Facebook page. The Ulster County Regional Chamber of Commerce is especially grateful to our amazing corporate sponsors. As a result of their commitment to the Chamber and our 1,000 local businesses, we are able to continue our work helping the local business economy. Please support these businesses, our corporate sponsors, that support your Chamber of Commerce. Thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you next week at our virtual breakfast meeting. Until then, be well, be well, and stay safe. Thank you.